I'm Dee Watkins, and today I will be joined by a writer, director, producer, a showrunner, award-winning showrunner um, of HBO's classic series Insecure, Prentice Penny. Today we'll be talking about his new must-see Hulu docu-series, Black Twitter. How's it going? Good, man. Happy to be here. I'm happy that you're here too, man. Congratulations on the new series. When I first heard there was a, a Black Twitter, um, documentary coming out I just like yeah what was I, your first thought I slipped right back into nostalgia because it was it was a moment in time um I couldn't stop laughing and I just thought about the amount of information um I learned and how I how I grew as a person so if you mm -hmm. can just start by telling us how the project came about yeah, so the project came about because um, Jason Parham, who was a journalist or who is a journalist, wrote the piece for Wired magazine. Mm -hmm. And he wrote the piece because he felt like, you know, so many things on the internet are impermanent, right? Here today, gone tomorrow, we're talking about like Friendster and Vine and sort of MySpace, all these things. And he felt it was the right amount of time to sort of give Black Twitter its flowers and sort of document all the things that had happened culturally on the platform, not just for our culture, but for American culture. And once the article came out, they brought it to me to see if I'd be interested in, in directing it as a docu-series. I think like it was um, Ferrari Shepard, who's like killing it in the art game right uh -huh. now, because he was really big on Black Twitter back in the day. Um, Bassy World, Feminista Jones, Encyclopedia yeah, Feminista Brown. Jones, yeah. yeah, so yeah. it's like following those pages, it's like, oh shit, I tapped into a, another universe. Yeah. Um, I'm clearly not the smartest person in the room and I'm here to learn. <laughs> yeah, well that's what I think is so dope about Twitter specifically that I think made the communities pop off is like, you know, to your point where like, you know, Facebook was really about reconnecting with friends you went to high school with or family members. Twitter was like, meet these strangers. Right, which I think black culture is always having to do with just kind of get out of our comfort zone to meet people. And I think our the natural way we have to move in the world just kind of moved uh, digitally as well. And I think that's how those communities kind of got built. Absolutely. How, how did you find black Twitter? Well, I'm from LA, so I was a Laker fan. So I kind of okay. came on <laughs> 08, 09 when Kobe was trying to get the championships without Shaq. So I was just trying to see like what's going on with the Lakers, what are we hearing, what's like, you know, who are we going to get, blah, blah, blah. And that was really then being on there following other, you know, following other players, following, right. you know, other analysts. And then who are they retweeting? Who are they posting? Oh, that's kind of funny. That's interesting. And I think that's really kind of how I, I got to the platform. I think what's so magical and special just about the docuseries is um, this world that developed inside of another world. Yeah. It's almost like the people who made Twitter didn't know what the fuck to do with it. <laughs> they didn't know what to do with it. And then black Twitter grew and it created a, a language that was adapted by everyone. Yeah, I mean, I think, you know, we talk about this in the doc that, you know, Facebook was very clear of what it was trying to be, you know, Twitter, all the different guys that created it, Jack and Biz and those guys kind of didn't ever agree on kind of what this platform is. Is it, a, is it a blogging space? Is it a news space? Is it a information sharing? Is it a podcasting space? And because it was so pliable, as black people do and black culture does, we can repurpose, you know, mm -hmm. we've been doing that like to survive in this country, you know, forever. So we're able, good at taking things that weren't meant for certain things and redoing them into things that work for us. And I think that's really, the pliability of the platform is, I think, fed into our natural creativity in terms of how we repurpose things. No, I'm glad you said repurpose because it's like you wear your older brother's shoes that are like two sizes too big <laughs> and then Balenciaga sees it and they're like, and oh, becomes, shit, yeah, yep. something brand new. Let's make the 10X sneaker yep. <laughs> that no one can fit, not even Shaq. Well, I think um, about guys too, like back in the day in hip hop, like Dapper Dan, right? That now absolutely. is like getting his flowers, obviously is doing these collabs with Gucci. But back then it was like, he was just doing that because he's like taking Gucci or Louie and redoing them in so many ways. And now, like you said, now it's like, oh, we need to be, you know, partnering up with that. Oh, yeah, shout out to Dap. You have some uh, very, very excellent people um, in the series. The, um, the great April Rain, yeah. um, creative the hashtag Oscar So White. Yeah. You have Wesley Lowry. Um, can you talk about some of the subjects you chose for the film? Yeah, I mean, some of the subjects obviously started from the article, right? So a lot of the stuff that Jason sort of chronicled as sort of the sort of the uh, three acts of what the article was going to be. For me, it was once we crafted what the story was going to be, which had to be different than the article, right? And so mm -hmm. as I read his article, it was broken down into three parts. And so as a storyteller, 
to me, that was like a three act structure. Right. And it kind of became a coming of age story because as a narrative, I'm always like, but what's the story? If you can just Google it, that's not a story. That's just information to mm -hmm. Google. Right. And for us, it was, oh, there's sort of this youth of black Twitter. If you think about coming of age stories, like we talked about Star Wars a lot as a reference point of like Luke in the beginning, doesn't know anything about the rebellion or the forest. He doesn't know anything about being a Jedi. This is all from. And then obviously Obi-Wan dies and it takes our hero into a darker world, right, in a much more challenging environment. And for us, that was similar. Like, Black Twitter's having this fun, we're talking about scandal, we're live tweeting, and then Trayvon happens. And so it takes the story into a different uh, direction. And so for us, it was, who are the people that can speak to Black Twitter becoming a, a coming of age story? So all of that started to shape, okay, are we talking about Trayvon? Are we talking about Oscar So White? Are we talking about Versus? Are we talking about how we dealt with the pandemic? And so everything had to sort of fit the coming of age story in the topics. So what surprised you from just having those conversations with all those different people about that particular era? I think the things that really surprised me were really the more so the people that we talked to that were working at Twitter, like TJ, Goddess, Rembert, who, was, who, who repped the Twitter handle, of just knowing how they didn't really know like, I understand how mainstream culture doesn't really understand black culture and understands how kind of what black Twitter would be. But I guess you thought sort of the people at Twitter understood clearly what's happening on this platform and to kind of learn they didn't really know what's happening on black Twitter or like, why, why is scandal getting all these sort of like huge numbers? Like, why right. is it trending so much? Right. And so for them, they really had to go in there and educate the platform on what's happening over here, right? And so I think I was really surprised at how much Twitter itself didn't know what was happening on Twitter itself. Yeah, that's amazing. It's amazing. That's amazing. Any uh, person you wanted in a film but you couldn't get a hold of? The the one person that we wanted in the in the film that we just couldn't time wise out was Kerry Washington. And I think you know, obviously, we talk about the way Scandal sort of grew, um, not just in numbers out of that show, but really like what how live tweeting kind of be how was kind of birthed out of that show. So I was just always wanted to know what did it feel like to be kind of the first person where the black Twitter culture is supporting you, showing up for you and having that be impacting the way that the show's ratings go, which impact how long the show gets to be on the air, yeah, right? Yeah. So so being in the being the first person where that was sort of a thing was someone I was like, oh, I'd like to know what it was like from her perspective as opposed to just the culture's perspective. I mean, you working in television, like, and being on the production side, your wheels are spinning because yeah. you're like, yo, this is how you feel. Because there was some really big insecure conversations on Twitter. Oh, 100%. You were team Lawrence, you was team Issa. Yeah. You know? Yeah. It's so funny. Like, I remember, you know, obviously, you know, working on the show from the beginning and, you know, we weren't anything. Nobody knew what we were. And then to watch, I remember season two, I remember going to Twitter uh, during the premiere or at some point, And I remember seeing off like top 10 of, of the top 10 things that were trending. We were like seven, seven of those topics, like mm. team Lawrence, team Daniel, Issa, Ma. and I was like, this is wild that like we're dominating the, the conversation right now, like more than Game of Thrones. And I was like, that's yeah. what was wild. Yeah, because the, the audience is there and every once in a while, the big production companies need to know yeah. that if you buy these shows, yeah. <laughs> the community yeah. is we'll there. We'll show up. Yeah, <laughs> we'll show up. Um, the funniest thing, um, and this this isn't my this isn't my quote. This is from someone way smarter than me. But back in the day, someone tweeted, um, some genius tweeted, "Twitter is a place. Well, Facebook is a place where you lie to your friends." Twitter is a place where you tell the truth to strangers. <laughs> That's real. <laughs> and I, I always thought about like um, when I joined the app, uh, I've met so many people yeah. um, in real life. Yeah. But I, and I don't think there's any other app where like I don't want to meet a fucking Instagram person. Right. But you want to meet your Twitter people. Have you ever met someone from Twitter? Yeah. I mean, before I think, you did the documentary, obviously. Uh, <laughs> yeah, I think there were people. I, I like I met April from Twitter before the doc and things like that. But I, I, I agree with you. I think there's something, you know, cause Twitter, you have to be speaking in essence. I mean, you're typing, but you're speaking like so different than Instagram, right? Which is a picture, which could kind of be anything. But I think in Twitter, you get to see is somebody funny, is somebody snarky, is somebody really smart, right? You get to see people's kind of the way they think. And I think that becomes a much more of an interesting person to want to meet than just kind of seeing a picture and kind of not knowing like what's happening here. Something you cover that is very important um, for a lot of us, um, those of us who work in, as journalists and in television, um, is this, the amount of, of talent that emerged from, from Black Twitter. 
And I was just thinking, do you ever think there would be like another vehicle for producing Pulitzer Prize winners, Emmy winners, executives um, from an app? Um, or, or have we moved on from that moment? Because so many people just got so many great opportunities. Of course, yeah, yeah, absolutely. You know, I don't know. I think it's one of those things where we, we've been talking, Jason and I, about like, is it going to happen somewhere else? Is it, you know, and, and I don't think so. I think that was a, the way Black Twitter happened was such a convergence of Obama era, the what was, had happened previously, you know, we, this platform is so pliable. You know, there was a lot of things in the world we needed to say, you know what I mean? Where I think like it served its it served its function on Twitter. I love seeing black Twitter's energy in the real world. What that shakes, I don't even know if the next way that it happens will even be social media. It might be a total because again, we weren't seeking out it to happen on Twitter. It just sort of happened because all these things kind of met. Um, so it's like to me, it's like like almost trying to predict like another big cultural moment. Like I don't think just another app is the way it's gonna happen. So this is one of the first reasons I saw like people, um, creatives start to scale back on Twitter. And I was curious, uh, I guess on a personal level, if this ever happened to you. Mm -hmm. um, I saw a thread I put together before, you know, before they even called them threads. It was just like, <laughs> just a bunch of, you know, like Mozola did the story. Yeah, I don't know if that yeah, was called yeah, a yeah. thread. I think she was just play by yeah, play. Yeah, it was action. just play by play. Yeah. Here, here it is. Yeah. And I saw it in someone's think piece. And I'm like, yo, what the fuck? <laughs> and then, <laughs> Somebody else was like, yo, I made this joke about such and such. And I put it on Twitter and it was like, you know, it was on fucking a star show. Yeah. So <laughs> did anyone ever clip you on Twitter? Uh, I'm sure. I'm sure. I'm sure. I, I haven't seen it, but uh, I'm, I'm sure they have. I'm sure they have. I'm sure they have. Yeah, it doesn't feel good. <laughs> no, no, no. It, it does. But also, it's like one of those things too, where it's like you know, you put it out there. Yeah, it's out there. It's out there. You know what I mean? But I, but I, I do know what you mean. But uh, I'm sure they have. You gotta save the joke until you publish the article, until you put the project out, and then you use the joke to promote. Is yeah. I've, now I've pur <laughs> now I've purposely like was about to tweet something and be like, oh no, 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 I'm gonna hold that. Like you know what I mean? Like there have been times when. We were like live tweeting on Insecure when we were talking about one thing that we were going to do. And I almost tweeted something about like what we were going to do. And then I was like, glad I didn't do it because we ended up doing it for another season. So there's times where I've been like, no, 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 no. I'm actually hold this back. Um, but yeah. Another thing I was I was wondering um, if you thought this or had a similar experience with the app, but it seemed like it started to decline for a lot of us even before Elon took over. Um, not just because of the bots, but because of just some of the craziness. Um, sure, yeah. For a moment, we had this golden era of beautiful article recommendations, beautiful television and film commentary mm -hmm. recommendations, all of these different things. And we were actually um, holding um, different cultures accountable as a collective, you know, online. Yeah. But then it turned, or it kind of turned into this place of, um, where well, everyone wanted to over police everything. Yeah. And I think a lot of people um, started staying away or not staying away, but it, it just, it, it, it turned into something different than, than that golden yeah. era. Um, was it, was it kind of over for you um, or begin to decline after the takeover or was this something happening? I think like any time, right? Like, you know, tons of hundreds of thousands and millions of people get on an app that you can certainly over police and also under police, right? And under protect. And I think there was a lot of things happening in terms of the way black women were being targeted, the way it sort of felt unsafe for black women um, at that time too. Mm -hmm. um, and, and so I think there were ways in which a lot of people started to pull back. And I think in general, also understanding, you know, maybe we're spending too much time on social media. At a, you know what I mean? So mm -hmm. I think a lot of, about, yeah, and making sure our mental health was okay. So I think, a lot of things were converging again on like, do we need to be on apps as much? Do we need to be on social media as much? And I think we were starting to see a lot of people pull back just in general. And I think all of those factors also led to people being like, this doesn't feel like the same um, fun and nostalgic space that it felt like in the beginning, right? And so I think all those things kind of led to it not, and, but I think you feel a huge um, different shift when Elon took over the platform. Yeah. Being a documentary versus a narrative storyteller for TV, um, in the way that you were insecure, audiences watch those projects in different ways. Um, they also carry different responsibilities. For you, what's the difference, and how do you see yourself as an artist in both categories? 
Yeah, I mean, I think obviously in a narrative space, you're you're saying whatever comes out of your imagination is kind of like what what is the most important thing, right? Um, and you know, this is my first time doing anything in the doc space, and I think the difference to me is it's not about everything that's in your in your creativity is the most important thing. It's like what's the story to the truth of the piece you're talking about, right? And are you honoring that in truth, right? Mm -hmm. So less less um less almost putting myself on it and more so letting the, like the subject matter dictate to me what the story should be as opposed to me saying, oh, the story should be about, for example, like Issa doing this or Issa doing that. This is this story is telling me this is where the story needs to go versus me imparting my opinion on where the story should go. Do you feel like, um, and you touched on this a little earlier um, about like what is what's the next thing um, but we know we have like uh, the black owned spill app. And, yeah. You know, I don't I don't know what the fuck happened to threads. It just like came. <laughs> like sometimes my phone reminds me that it's there yeah, 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 <laughs> in a magical yeah. way. But are, are we going to be able to create this space um, on a different platform or is it something that just happened, you know, and I think you'll see different platforms just because I think different people want different things. Right. Like, um, so I think Spill will be one. I think, you know, obviously like Blue Sky and Mastodon. I think these places will definitely are, are, are have grown and, and continue to grow. Uh, but I think as like Jason talked about, he was like, you know, people have left, I can't call it X, people have left Twitter. But but by and large, like black people are still, <laughs> I just can't call it that. Uh, black people are still on the platform, actually. And cause I think black culture always wants to, like we, and I think that's what black Twitter got to be. We got to be like, we're doing our thing here, but we also like being in the mainstream conversation too, right? So I don't think black culture ever wants to be told you have to only talk about this or you have to only play over here. I think we want to play in all of it. So I don't know if like, again, just another app can fully capture that moment or capture like, oh, we're all going to go here now. Because again, we're not a mon like we're not a monolith right, either, right? right. Um, so I'd be curious to see where all this stuff shakes out. Because it's interesting because I have children, who, I have teenagers, and they're not on any of those things, right? They're all like TikTok kids. So right. even even where that's going to be, right? Right. Yeah. They're like, no, you can't have TikTok unless you... Uh follow Joe Biden. But, <laughs> but like, it's, it's funny, you said you can't call it that because one of my colleagues uh, that I teach with at University of Baltimore said, I used to get all of my article recommendations for Twitter, but now it's X and it should be called X because it's just a bunch of porn. And I'm like, it, it, makes, it, makes, it makes so much sense. One thing I will say though is um, I did feel a moment of the old Twitter coming back uh, and seeing people who I haven't seen in years on the app with the Kendrick and, yeah. and, uh, and Drake beef. Yeah. Um, I was about to say J. Cole, but he like, he, 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 he took the mental out. health route. Yeah, he, yeah. Took, he, took the, he took the mental health route. But I, but I think you do see Black Twitter showing up, like even when the Alabama brawl happened. They showed up. Like they, they showed, showed up. up. So that's why they're like, oh, we're still there. We're just not there in the way that it was there in, the, in that moment, right? Because obviously like there's moments in which the fun of, you know, scandal and those kind of shows. But then there are ways that we had to show up, obviously, you know, um, you know, for, you know, in, you know, during the civil unrest st stuff that was happening at such a huge um, moment and, and so frequently, right? So there was this level of, oh, we got to like stay on guard. Whereas I think now we've kind of, because the world was so much more he heightened, right? Um, at that time. And then, so I, so I think you're seeing the, because the world, I mean, obviously the world's always heightened, but not in the same way that it was then, obviously, and, and with the pandemic. That, but you, I think you definitely see it, you know, sh like show up in black cultural moments like the Alabama and like Kendrick and Drake, yeah. Uh, we, we love the series, um, but we also, we're, we're missing Insecure, so we wanna know what else are you coming with? Uh, well, sending, we have to send you back to work. Uh, yeah, well, we have some stuff coming out uh, uh, like this summer. I'm doing a pilot for Onyx and, and nice. some more stuff for them, yeah. Nice, nice, but congratulations. We're Thank always you. here to see uh, uh, Issa D come back as like a scamming uh, city council member for Compton, because <laughs> Black Girl Magic costs a lot of money. It's a yeah. whole new storyline. Yeah, so there you to, go. Like, skim for the top, but <laughs> wishful thinking. Thank you so much. I appreciate that, brother. Absolutely, man. Absolutely. Thank you. Thank you for watching Salon Talks. Be sure to subscribe as we feature some of your favorite artists, authors, and more. And while you're here, you might as well watch another video by clicking right here.